Life was going on as it normally goes on before the riot. Uh, as far as I am concerned, I was having my normal day. I lived off the Gwinnett Street area, which is now Laney Walker Boulevard. I went down to the courthouse because there was a gathering, gathering down there that had to do with the Oakland boy's death. So I was curious, as usual, as to be what's going on here. And so I had gone down to see quite a crowd had gathered uh, to find out what was going on, and the crowd was becoming more and more angry. So I had come back home, back out to my house, uh, off uh, Laney Walker now, and before I knew it, uh, people were throwing rocks and things. As Caucasians passed through the area, leaving from downtown, uh, folks were very angry about this child's death, that nobody knew why, and that was just a boil over. And things continued to get heated, and before you knew it, lots of crowd had uh, I'd gathered and I was standing out waving, don't come, go back, go back, go back. And the crowd gathered and, and, and kind of ended up on Laney Walker, angry, tearing down things, and they tore down the uh, red and white soup, uh, grocery store, and the looting and rioting started with that. In my mind, I've always been an activist. Activist is a word that has been created and it's, it names people who do things and then once they get notoriety, they become quote unquote, and activist. I've always taken part in my community from a child. So it was just doing, like I said, I was standing out telling people to go back, don't come this way. You're coming into a dangerous area now. You know, you're not welcome right now. And so as far as being an activist, I wouldn't have called myself an activist. I would have called myself a concerned citizen being involved in her community. In my everyday life, I wouldn't say I noticed any tensions. We lived in our uh, black and white neighborhoods and continue with our black and white life. The Civil Rights Act had passed. We're five years past that. So the change that's about to become, or that's becoming a reality, is probably happening. We started to integrate. I was working at the hospital when integration occurred, and one of the incidents was, and he's deceased now, a very famous surgeon, came in to visit one of the Caucasian female patients, and she had him to come down to whisper, I don't it was a black and white lady. He says, if you want to have the surgery, this is the room, or you may leave. So integration had come, and people weren't sure what that was going to be like. And I'm sure the power structure didn't know what it was going to be like. So sure, I'm sure there were some underlying tensions. During that time, and in early times, the church has always played a very large role in the black community as far as its health is concerned. And I don't mean like health, physical health. Uh, our our well-being kind of revolved around the church. All of our information basically came through the church. And so with voting uh, rights and issues of that sort, I don't recall and remember that voting rights uh, was an issue. We knew that we could vote. But getting people to understand the importance of voting was still the, the issue. Poverty, jobs, the same identical things that you hear politicians say today, was the first thing that uh, part of their platform is gonna create jobs. So naturally, in the black community at that time, poverty was an issue. Housing, uh, getting the benefits of your taxes that you were paying. Uh, was an issue. So you have to educate your public to let them know that you have a right. You're talking about voting rights, but you have a right to voice your opinion and demand what is yours based on the fact that you are a tax-paying citizen. So at that time, as I said, church was very important. So a lot of information that we received would have come through preachers. The one thing that existed at that time, and some of us still talk about it, no matter what the issue was that affected us as a people, if we heard it in church, it didn't matter whether I was in North Augusta, South Carolina, Augusta, Georgia, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, all the way to the coast. There was one central message. And how it got to us, I haven't a clue. But we all knew it, and we would all respond to it. That kind of messaging is not uh, present today. You have, uh, following the civil rights movement and desegregation, uh, you have a right to enjoy the benefits of America, and we have. So you have a 
uh, there's much talk about white flight, but there was no talk about black flight. So the strength that was in black communities at the time that I grew up and during the time of the 70s no longer exist in the quote unquote black community. If you were to ask me, uh, where is the black community or what is identified as the black community now in Augusta, Georgia, I would all have to pause and think where that is since integration. The family, uh, my mother, my father, myself, and a couple of other uh, family members, uh, we were returning from Chicago where we had attended the funeral of my grandmother. And um, in Chicago, we had heard nothing about what was going on. And the time span between having left Augusta and returning to Augusta was somewhat like maybe five days. Okay, so, um, Upon coming back through Atlanta, I think we began to see some media or hear some media that something had taken place in Augusta, a riot uh, relative to uh, race relations. A relative picked us up at the airport and that's where we began to learn more, get just a little bit more detail. And so the relative said, well, let's just drive back through Laney Walker Boulevard where a lot of the rioting took place. And of course, I have the picture in my mind of Laney Walker Boulevard when I left five days prior, and now here I'm coming back to Laney Walker Boulevard, and it's nothing like the picture I had in my mind when I left five days previous. Yes, there was smoke, there was some burning, and of course, the, the whole area was like, desolate. There were no people on the street. Um, everything was like quiet and like everybody was shut up inside the um, house. So we just rode back through um, all the way up Lena Walker Boulevard because we lived in the section of town called Sand Hill. So this was a straight path and an easy access. Um, the initial impression Gee, this, this certainly is different. Um, and so that was my initial, I guess, engagement in the movement of change that was to come and perhaps that I would subtly uh, uh, become aware of as I began to continue to live here in Augusta and to experience uh, the change. I was a teacher in the Richmond County Public School System and I began my teaching career at the A.C. Griggs Elementary School uh, which was a segregated uh, black school located in the Turpin Hill area. And of course, it was probably like within the very next year um, when we as teachers began to hear and learn more about a desegregation court order that the Richmond County School System was under and that teachers were going to be transferred um, from school to school. So the first phase of the integration because of that court order was to transfer teaching staff. And so with that um, change in my life from the riot was to be moved from a predominantly black elementary school in Turpin Hill to the Montesana Elementary School up in the Somerville area, higher up on the hill. Um, where my classroom and the students would become um, all white Anglo-Saxon students. So that was the first phase. I didn't notice any difference in, in how the white class received me as I did when my African-American uh, black students received me. I think children were basically children, and at least I was still basically that teacher. Um, I was just simply transferred from a black school to a white school. 
And so at the Montesana Elementary School, I was assigned to third and, and, and fourth grade children. About that time, the students were being integrated. That was uh, somewhere around 74, 75, okay? And so the students, so I had some, I had a mixture of children, African American as, as well as white students. Again, from the perspective of the classroom, the teacher, uh, the mixture of students, I noticed no, no difference. And the, the children, all children responded to the teaching. Um, there was a cooperative relationship focusing on the needs of the students between myself and other African-American teachers, myself and other white teachers, because the reading and math that the children got from me did not replace the reading and math that they received in the regular classroom. So it was incumbent upon us, uh, multiple teachers of the same students, to be able to work together, to communicate together, to plan instruction, present and provide instruction on behalf of each of those students in a focused, organized manner that was best for the uh, student. That's kind of from getting off that airplane on that uh, particular day, back in the 70s when the race riots started, to, my, to span my 43-year career in the Richmond County public school system and where instances of color, instances of race, those things were a part of my history, uh, but actually no adverse effect from it, but yet realizing that yes, uh, race uh, is a part of my life and my career as I moved um, through the district. The keystone of any democratic society is the electoral process. So in that way, I don't see so much of a problem as there being a lack of black elected officials. I will always go back to there being a lack of black participation overall in the electoral process. It's very important that people, uh, under, because we are, uh, America in particular, we are of the people, by the people, for the people. And so the people have to always know that their voice is number one, their needs are number one, and our elected officials are there to serve them. So the steps that we need to take, number one, folks need to be registered to vote, so we need to come up with as many creative opportunities as we can to enroll voters. Then they need to get to the polls. If there's a need for a, um, a runoff election, we need to get those folks back to the polls. And then we need to participate in our local municipal meetings that occur so we can hear firsthand rather than maybe uh, just by the media was actually being said and we can ask questions on the, on the spot. And we also need to let our officials know what we need. Um, one of the easiest way to do that is by building neighborhood associations. So we need to have what I call a front door participation and, and policy that each person needs to feel that you know, they, they are to be they are to be heard and they are important. So that's what's most important is participation in the system. That's part of the great work institutions that the Laney Museum do as far as disseminating and diffusing information. We have, we've had a very rapid level of growth of historical monuments, but the general public still is not aware of those individuals, those monuments. Our young people need to see there was something there, there can be something there now and also something there in the future. Say for example where before we had the Golden Blocks and it had that name because of the wealth and prosperity and the density of that area. Now there are vacant lots and there are no monuments to what was there. So the young people of this generation really have just a 
tiny fraction of information of the great things that were produced in Augusta by people who were you know, local, native to Augusta. So in that way, historic uh, preservation and, dis and the dissemination of historical facts need to be uh, greatly supported so that young people do have this information. So in other words, what our, our gain is to be is that that talent remains here in Augusta instead of creating a brain drain of thinking that they have to go to Atlanta or Charlotte. They need to know that they can be prepared and be contributive right where they are. That's very important. One of the things that we're witnessing and it's being reported in a lot of different ways about issues current and the future concerning black rights is we're seeing a pipeline of discipline issues that are disproportionate for black young men and for disabled um, students, you know, in the public school setting and then going into the prison system. Primary to that is that if we have disruptive behavior, we need to go back to the causes of the disruptive behavior and not just looking at who is being disruptive because that really could happen to almost anyone. We have students that are entering high school that do not have elementary level skills and so being that the public schools are funded at the county level, we need to be sure our county is making education number one and not making necessarily discipline number one. That also goes back to first teachers, the family, mothers are first teachers. So we need to let them know that the family is the most important and be as creative, creative as we can in bringing families and parents into the public school system so that they are also a part of this growth process in, in which we're building citizens, productive, contributive, happy citizens. And from citizens come our leaders. Yes, that's the pipeline that we want to see. We want to see each citizen re feeling really is a, really they are a leader. They're a leader in their neighborhood, you know, in their city, and then of course on to the, the national level. We need to have more exchanges between the churches, the churches in the bottom and the churches on the hill, and so that you will not have this uh, seclusion. Uh, during the times of segregation, part of the beauty of segregation is that you had people, you had uh, people who were striving, uh, people who were executives, um, and people who were middle class, people worked in mills, they all lived together, you know, in the community. So you had the opportunity to see people in exchange. You knew them by name. You weren't just someone passing by in a car. You knew who these individuals were. And I don't see that happening now in Augusta, that we know exactly who the heroes and the sheroes are right in your own neighborhood. And in the sense that this exchange so that we're no longer a white community or a black community. You know, we're at the point now there is so much uh, tolerance, so much interaction from nine to five, we need to extend that interaction on Saturday and Sunday also too, so that our young people, you know, will have an opportunity um, to, see what's, to see what's different. institutions such as the museums and and you know it doesn't have to be the, the mega museums such as you know Smithsonian's new museum the real work is done at the grassroots level with these museums such as the um, Laney Museum that um, promulgate uh, economic growth economic development They're, these places are spreading the word these places are um, helping to educate people about the importance of, of um, being economically stable. So I, I absolutely uh, believe that it starts at, like I said, the, the micro level, you know, the small, it's, the, it's these, you know, it's the Lucy Craft Laneys, it's these, these community um, people that are in touch with their own communities. No one from outside can come in and just, you know, put in some sort of systematic approach to help these communities. The people that know and work and live in these communities are the ones that are most prepared to, um, to help stabilize and grow. We often, um, when we look at 
things that enhance the community. We, we always talk about sometimes a catalyst project. So for instance, when you do something um, as critically important as expand Lucy Laney, you know, museum, that sparks other things, you know, uh, other projects that are needed um, to support that. You know, you expand something enough, you bring enough visitorship into an area, then suddenly you need, um, you know, restaurants to support that or, you know, businesses to support that. So once you identify key um, institutions, museums, and those things that, that really do bring outside people in, because that's what you want. You want that churn. You want visitors coming in. You want people to say, well, you know what, why don't we take the, the hour and half drive over to Augusta and look at the museum today. You, you want people to do that and, and come in. And when they do that and they're here, they say, oh, well, why don't we grab a bite to eat somewhere or, you know, or, or, or you know, potentially an, at this museum in Augusta, we learned about this. Why don't we now go and, and, and see, um, you know, or visit, you know, something else nearby in Augusta that, that you actually learned in that museum. So, so you, all of this is about interconnectivity and being able to um, have what you call, what we call these catalyst projects that, that you strategically do to help, you know, build, you know, infill and support projects for them and infrastructure, you know, which also generates um, income and jobs. My thoughts about where Augusta could be 20 years from now is, um, is amazing. I mean, there is so much untapped, um, you know, history and, and, and so much that's not said and so much that's not put forth. You actually have to, when you're here, you know, me, I'm not from Augusta. And, you know, like I said, six years ago when I came here, um, you learn that it's Okay, it's not just about the masters, you know. It's amazing. There, there's, it's, it's, all, it's sort of like a, you know, a, a treasure chest that's sitting there that's not been opened. There's so much potential. So, um, you know, the reason why, as an outsider, I come back to Augusta every year and I keep the connection here is because of that. Um, you see the potential in the people. You see the potential in the history. You see the potential in, um, in just the area that, you know, it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's developing, it's got this, it's got these, um, you know, these great isolated things <laughs> that are going on that just need to be culled together and, and connected and working together with each other to create something that's bigger than the, the sum of its parts, you know. It will get there. Augusta will get there, I, I absolutely believe it. The reason why I believe it is because of, there are a lot of people here who are dedicated to, to getting Augusta there. There's a lot of, there are a lot of people who are dedicated to um, better men and telling the story and, and understanding, well look, we're sitting on something here that could be um, you know, a benefit to us. And we need to share and we need to um, reap the, the, the benefits of, of this, you know, so. Um, and God, the, just the tremendous history, you know, why is it, um, why is it not shared, you know? So I think, um, yeah, I, I think it will get there. For more information about our black heritage and to see an interactive map on black historic sites in Augusta, Georgia, visit our website at lucycraftladymuseum.com. Thank you.